In the last video, we talked about rate, rhythm, axis, and intervals. The last thing I do is check the morphologies of each of the waves and check for ST changes. Let's begin by looking at the morphologies of the P waves. Look to see if the P wave morphology within a lead and PR intervals in general are consistent. When looking at P wave morphology, also look at the PR intervals to see if they are depressed. Depressed PR intervals in all or nearly all leads is a sign of pericarditis. You can see here that the PR intervals are not depressed, but are at the same baseline as the rest of the EKG. In evaluating the P wave morphology and looking for PR interval depression, you should look at all 12 leads. However, we pay special attention to leads 2 and V1 because the P waves in these leads can tell us if there's atrial enlargement. Since atrial enlargement is generally not a groundbreaking finding on EKG, we won't spend much time on it. But here are the criteria if you're dying to know. After evaluating the morphology of the P waves, look at the QRS complexes in all 12 leads. Are there Q waves? In this case, there's no Q wave, which is normal. That means that the first wave in this QRS complex is an R wave. If the patient does have a Q wave, as shown here, how do you know when it's pathologic? Any Q wave in leads V1 to V3 should be considered pathologic. In all other leads, consider a Q wave pathologic only if it's at least one box wide and greater than one third the height of the R wave. If you see what you think is a pathological Q wave, check in the other leads in the same coronary artery distribution that we discussed in a previous video. If a Q wave appears in more than one lead in the same arterial distribution, there's a good chance that you're seeing real pathological Q waves. Let's look at this EKG for Q waves. Ooh, look at this, a nice Q wave in AVR. What do you think about this Q wave? Remember, AVR is a special lead and in general not very useful. Its direction is opposite all the other leads, so what looks like a Q wave here is actually just a flipped R wave. When evaluating the QRS complex, you also want to look for left ventricular hypertrophy, or LVH. There are a number of different criteria for LVH, but the one I like to use is the R wave in V5 or V6 plus the S wave in V1 greater than 35 millimeters. Let's see if this EKG shows LVH. Here we see in V1 that the S wave is about 8 millimeters tall. Taking the bigger R wave between V5 and V6, we say that V5 has an R wave of approximately 9 millimeters. 8 millimeters plus 9 millimeters equals 17 millimeters, which is less than 35 millimeters. Therefore, in this case, there is no left ventricular hypertrophy. Because your attending might like to use different criteria than I do, here is a full list of the possible criteria you can use to evaluate for LVH. The final thing to look for when studying QRS morphology is R wave progression. Although there are a few hard rules for what constitute proper R wave progression, the general idea is that the QRS complex should get more positive as you progress through the precordial leads. In other words, V2 should generally be more positive than V1, and V3 more positive than V2, and so on. This may not hold true for every lead, but the general trend should be there. Let's look at this EKG. In V1, you see only a tiny blip of an R wave and a predominant S wave. In V2, there is a small but more noticeable R wave and still a large S wave. In V3 now, you can see that the R wave is getting larger, the F wave slightly smaller, and in V4 again, the R wave slightly bigger, the S wave slightly smaller. This trend continues in V5 as the R wave again gets bigger, the F wave smaller. While in V6, the R wave may be slightly smaller than in V5, the S wave continues to get smaller and thus the complex continues the general trend of becoming more positive.
Thus, in this case, there is normal R-wave progression. When someone has poor R-wave progression, it's possible they have had an anterior MI in the past. The last things to look at on an EKG are some of the most important things, and they are ST segment changes and T-wave morphology. ST segment depressions and T-wave inversions are suggestive of myocardial ischemia. ST segment elevations are concerning for myocardial injury, and while there is a differential for ST elevation, the most concerning cause is a STEMI. In this example, the ST segment is at exactly the same level as the PR segment, so there is no ST depression or elevation. An ST depression would look like this. and an ST elevation would look like this. Just to reiterate this concept, we see an ST depression here and an ST elevation here. When you are reading an EKG in real life, it's very important to look for ST changes in all 12 leads. The last comment I have regarding T-wave morphology is that you may also see peaked T-waves which are associated with hyperkalemia. Large T waves are not the same as peak T waves. When thinking about the difference between large and peak T waves, I like to ask myself if it would hurt my butt to sit on the T wave. If it's round and smooth, like this, it wouldn't hurt. But if it's pointy, like this, it would hurt my butt. And thus, this is a peak T wave. In this EKG, do you think these T waves are large T waves or peak T waves? If you said peak T waves, you are correct. Here's the system we've gone over for approaching EKGs.